I got a kid who wants someone who speaks Russian. You know, Jimmy, the girls and I have been talking, and if your cousin doesn't start showing us some respect, we're not gonna tip out anymore. All right, yeah. I'll talk to him. Who are you talking about, the DJ? All right, yeah. seriously? I shared my playlist with him, and he was very rude and dismissive. You're killing me. Let's go, come on. No. No, I'm eating my food. That's why you have Tupperware. Keep things fresh. Oh, He's eating. Wow. He's a spender. Come on, okay, let's go. Tom is money, baby. Get a roll on it. Welcome to Tonebender Sound Design Podcast, presented by Sound Ideas. This is the show where we talk with the sonic artists behind our favorite films, games, and series. Check out Sound Ideas' latest library, Just Wind Sound Effects. From sinister breaths of wind to the dramatic power of a tornado, these recordings capture the tonal qualities of each gust. Just Wind has 567 melodic howls, groans, and whistles. Give it a listen at sound-ideas.com. Hello everyone, my name is Tim Muirhead. I'm so glad you are joining me for this talk about a film I just really, really loved. Honora won the Palme d'Or at Cannes this year. It is a funny film, it's a touching film, a romantic film, an outright enraging film, and it's also just a heartbreakingly beautiful film. The film starts as our two main characters meet and start a fairy tale romance until things fall off the rails and head in many unexpected directions. I'm not sure how wide the release will be for this film, but I think if you search it out, you will not be disappointed. It has some really interesting sound work as well. So today I'm talking to Andy Hay and John Warren, the film's supervising sound editors and also the re-recording mixers. Let's just get to it. Here we go. All I knew going in was that it had won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. So I was expecting something good, but I didn't really even know the plot when I entered the theater. And a couple hours later, when we filed out, I'd been overwhelmed by Nora. I loved the film. It's directed by Sean Baker. This film has a bigger budget and scope than his previous films like Red Rocket and The Florida Project. But it still feels like it's coming from the same voice, which unto itself I think is a kind of an amazing trick that he did. I immediately started working to figure out how I could get the sound team on Tone Menders, and I'm super happy that I succeeded. And joining us today, we have Andy Hay and John Warren, who are both the film's supervising sound editors and re-recording mixers. Welcome to the show, Andy. What food groups were you riding on the faders for this one? Well, first of all, Tim, thanks for having us. It's really a treat to be on the podcast. I'm a huge fan, and so it's really nice to be able to sit down and and have a chat. Um, I spend my time on the dialogue uh, loop group and music faders. We also have uh, John Warren. So by default, I guess you are on the sound effects, John. Yeah, sound effects, Foley. Right on. I believe that both of you kind of have a bit of a music background. How did you end up kind of meeting and end up working together? Maybe, Andy, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, So, yeah, like you mentioned, I come from a music background. I've been playing instruments since I was a kid and made my way out to L.A. with the intent of of being a recording engineer. Played in bands a bunch, but very much, you know, preferred being on the other side of the glass. I arrived here in the mid-90s, had a very typical Hollywood experience, you know, sort of trying to find your way. I think what's interesting about the music background, it's so informative in terms of like how it translates into what I'm doing now in, in film. There's many things about my experiences, like playing in clubs, mixing in clubs, and just, you know, being someone who goes to see a lot of shows that I think is super informative in sort of music mixing, which is why I find myself very comfortable in that chair. As far as John and I, like, coming together, we met through a mutual friend and then discovered we had a bit of love and respect for each other's work. Our first interactions were really more social and then it turned into some collaborations like work-wise. And, and I think we just sort of gelled pretty quickly and realized that we share a similar aesthetic uh, in terms of the kind of things that we enjoy sonically, the kind of uh, experimentation that we like to take. And just like enjoy hanging, hanging out with each other as, as people, you know. So much of the job is spending hours and hours and hours and hours grinding, you know, in dark 
rooms. Um, and so it's important to be able to put up with one another. And, and I think that's something that we do really well. And, you know, this partnership has blossomed over the years. It's been really lovely. You know, we've, we've had a banner year with several indie projects uh, under our belt this year. And, uh, you know, we, we look forward to, to many, many more. You know, it's really important to me, like the communal experience of what I do, what we do, what we do here having Andy come in and also just being a huge fan of his work and the way he mixes, it's been a real pleasure. And the fact we both come from the music background, I think we both jumped into Audio Post around the same age. And so I had, you know, started in music, got signed to a label right out of uh, college. I, I credited myself as a sound designer on our second album because I was putting in all these weird sounds in the mid-90s. I had an experimental filmmaker older brother, and he would turn me on to a lot of art house films through my life. And in my early 30s, I decided to jump over to doing film full time, film and TV. You know, we both have that music background and we both work on projects. I think that the directors appreciate that because we do a lot of projects that can utilize our skills as having that music background. Speaking of directors, the director of uh, Anora, which we're talking about today, Sean Baker, he seems to have a real ear for sound. And in fact, he even got a sound credit as a sound editor on Red Rocket, I believe. Do you want to talk about what it was like working with him and what he brings to the sound on a project? I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Especially on Red Rocket, you know, Sean, he is very big picture oriented. He's not just attuned with with sound, it's everything. You know, he's really an auteur in the truest sense of the word. And so he's laid out a vision from the script. You know, I think the way he shoots, he's shooting with sound in mind. He's shooting with everything in mind. He's not a director that you goes, oh, shoot, this is going to be a problem when it comes to the mix or anything. He's very well thought out especially in Red Rocket, had a lot of ideas that he put into into the edit. With Anora, it was quite different. We actually didn't have a lot in there. We had learned his language with Red Rocket, and he was you know, really comfortable with knowing that Andy had started with Sean on Florida Project, and then Andy and I joined together for Red Rocket. After Red Rocket, Sean knew that we, we knew what he wanted, and the interesting thing about Anora is we actually had to get started before he even knew how the film was going to end. I mean, we knew from the script, but he works very linearly. He doesn't, he's not a person that does a first pass and goes back and edit. He works from start to finish, usually doesn't touch the edit that much after that. He was still working on the last two reels, and we had to get started so our first spotting session, we only could get through six of the eight reels or five of the eight reels. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, and, and it's true that he is, he is super thoughtful in terms of thinking ahead of how he thinks things might sound, probably from even script level. But then if you talk to him about the, the shooting experience, you know, he wakes up every morning and he's got a whole host of new ideas of what he actually wants to shoot today. And so he'll get on set and talk to the actors and be like, okay, we're going to change everything. And it's going to be this instead of that. And, you know, so, so, um, so curveballs, you know, everywhere. And, and how that translates to us is, you know, he's um, particularly on the dialogue side, on the production audio side, like he's, he's doing a, a sort of almost documentary style run and gun sort of shooting process uh, in a lot of his work. I mean, obviously some of it is very well choreographed and so on, and we'll get into some of that stuff too, but a lot of it is is like camera and boom, you know, chasing these actors around. That presents its own unique set of challenges in terms of like what comes through in the dialogue tracks. You know, we have to exercise a bit of restraint in terms of cleaning stuff up, you know. We, we have a couple of dialogue editors that we work with, Jesse Pomeroy, who I've known and loved for years and years and years and have learned a ton from as well in terms of like the dialogue edit process and our, and our mutual friend, uh, Nick Pavey as well. So both of those guys are, are on board and we have to sort of implore them that there will be no ADR. Um, <laughs> and by the way, you can't clean anything up, you know, so because because oftentimes, you know, Sean loves like all the imperfections, right? He's he's really he's a he's a realist, a neo realist, whatever whatever you might want to call it. But um, but he's very much like is dialed into all of those imperfections. Like he hears that stuff in the edit. And oftentimes I think a lot of that stuff is 
somehow informative of the edit, whether conscious or subconscious. And so if that stuff goes missing, you very much notice it. So where we might ordinarily, you know, split out PFX and then just throw them in the trash on, on any other type of, of film, all the PFX stay in, you know, we make, make good use of them. One particular uh, thing that was a challenge on this one when it comes to the production, you know, some of those club scenes, there's music playing in the club while they're shooting. That's part and parcel of why some of the club scenes sound like they do, right? And so effectively then in those cases, we're, we're sort of solving for two problems, right? We're solving for clarity on dialogue, but then we're also solving for making the music work. You know, he's a huge fan of these like L cuts where it's just sharp cuts with like no crossfade across, across uh, not just across scenes, but across cuts within a scene. And so that sort of works into our favor because like we can be brutal with our, with our music cuts, but then it requires, you know, music editorial to sort of follow production, right? And so to get the source music tracks and sync them up, you know, sample accurate to what's actually happening in the production tracks. And then it falls on me to find a blend between center realism and then width with the source tracks and, you know, finding placement of, of all those things, which is really something very unique and very different and not what we're typically accustomed to, certainly on most most projects. So that that definitely keeps us on our toes. The first half of the movie, maybe not first half, but uh, the first chunk of the movie very much takes place in a club. There's music happening the entire time. And even when we go kind of backstage, you can still hear that music pumping. But it sounds really realistic. And I guess you're saying that's because it was actually there. Yeah, some of it is there. I mean, it's not it's not wall-to-wall, -wall, like in the club. And, and in fact, the club, I think, less or so. Some of the other locations is, is we had music spill from production audio. But, you know, what we did, we, we sat down with Sean, John and I both, and we mapped out the geography of, of the club, right? So, like, this is the main floor. This is the adjacent room where there's lap dances happening. This is the more private zone. This is the hallway that takes you around the bend and up the stairs. And then that's where that sort of VIP area is up top. And then back behind that is where the private rooms are. They're a little bit more isolated. So that, you know, we sort of mapped it out on a piece of paper, and then let that inform us in terms of like, you know, what each area should sound like because of the amount of spill that would be coming over from the main floor, right? The main floor is, is the most raucous and loudest part of the club. And so how much of that is spilling into these other parts of the club um, was informative of how I would mix the music. And then John, obviously, like with the, with the Walla and so on. In terms of like my source music, layout i mean i usually have a bucket of eight devoted to source music that got blown out to 16 or 24. there's a great um interview with mike semanic that i saw you know years and years ago when he did the social network right the facebook movie and i just loved his approach on that you know he talks about how he thinks of the location of the actors versus the speaker placement within the nightclub, right? There's that iconic scene where the music is blaring, blisteringly loud, and yet you hear every line. And a lot of that has to do with how the, the music is composed around the dialogue, which was, you know, something that we didn't have the luxury of because we're working with source music that has vocals embedded in it and we don't have those splits and so on. But nonetheless, um, the thought process was, you know, what are the speakers in each room? Where are they located? How old are they? Does this one have a blown out cone? You know, so it's it's multiple tracks of the source music. You know, I'm a huge fan of the IRs in like Futzbox or Speakerphone, right? And so I'm thinking about placing each speaker within the club. And then does it have a bit of saturation on it? You know, obviously EQ compression and then reverb. I'm a huge fan of the Lexicon 480. I mean, I think that goes back again to my music mixing days where you know, put a lark in front of me and I can dial up anything you want, right? It's just, I, it just, it's so familiar to me now that, that I feel like that's just a tool that I can, I can get what I, whatever I have in my mind out of it. It's a ton of tracks, um, all with the same music on them, behaving as individual speakers with individual placement, EQ, compression, reverb settings, and so on. And then being dynamic with the relative balance of all of those things, such that we're never 
uh, in a static position musically, right? There's always some degree of one speaker becoming louder while another one is dipping out and so on and so forth within a particular location. And then as we go to the other rooms, again, it's then, okay, which speakers are playing in this room? And then, oh, I need to think about what's spilling over from the main room. You know, is it mostly low end that's spilling over? You know, maybe again, there's like a tweeter blaring, you know, somewhere above us. So, so it's really using that map that we created and then very much so thinking about all of those speaker sources and how they, they fit in time and space. Yeah, it's, it's time consuming, but it's really worth it because I think it, it gives you like a, an ultimate sense of realism versus just putting a stereo track up, spreading it wide and throwing a bit of reverb on it and, and calling it a day, you know? That work shows through because, as I say, it felt super real, I guess is the way, right way to phrase it. John, do you want to talk about what you were doing to keep the nightlife in the club alive? Like Andy said, we kind of mapped it out. And Sean is, you know, he's very much a realist. So there's lots of discussions about the actual locations. So it's less fictional and we're, we're trying to make it sound as real as possible, but also to that actual uh, specific location. You know, obviously, Andy and I have to be in sync with, we've got music coming from this location, but also the bleed. And so making sure that we're treating everything a certain way for all the locations. And um, the other thing is Sean gets some great recordings on set. We have recordings of crowd sounds as well to layer in. And those are all really, really helpful. He usually cuts in a kind of bass layer to get us started having those crowd sounds to to supplement with with what we add from you know from library and from loop group it helps out a lot it helps it makes it uh, make it sound even that much more real of course most of that is you know center channel it certainly helps out a lot loop group and crowd you're putting up the middle no 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 sorry the the uh, the production crowd stuff yeah pfx essentially but they're separate wild recordings that Sean does for most of the lo- locations any type of crowd or automobiles or anything we're getting the separate uh, wild recordings that production sound does Having that as a center channel really helps. We're constantly like peeking over, each, you know, it's like, stay on your side of the car. We're, we're looking at each other, the screens, like, okay, what, what reverb are you doing there? What are you, you know, what yeah. are you panning? How are we moving through space? Because yeah. again, like, you know, it's it's not the sort of like static nature of an EQ setting or reverb setting. And, and you know, a lot of the club stuff and, and certainly some of the later club scenes where Toros is leading the charge to go find Yvonne. Some of those clubs are so freaking loud, you know, and also the the uh, the New Year's party, right, at the mansion. And Sean wants the music to be blisteringly loud and, and, and believable and people, you know, having to yell over the music, right? And 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 so, you know, having spent some time in those locations, like I, I know what that feels like and sounds like. And, and so you're really like just making space for the upper mids and the high frequencies of the dialogue to come through and robbing the low end and the low mids with the music. And so you're doing some very aggressive sort of EQ work to get those two things to gel and to fit so that you can really bump the music right up against it. I'm doing some of that work and John's like, what are you doing there? And where, where's, you know, and I'm looking at him, oh, how, how are you panning that? And I should follow you. And so it's really fun. I mean, it, it, that's the part of the mixing that, that is, is so fun and collaborative where almost that we push each other, you know, to, you know, you're always trying to do your best for yourself and for your filmmaker, but then having a co-mixer that is so enthusiastic about, you know, one-upping each other so that we're, we're putting the best stuff forward is, is just super engaging and super fun. Sonic Days 2024 is coming up next month from November 19th to 21st in Kolding, Denmark. Sonic Days is a celebration of everything to do with sound design and is packed with amazing talks, panels, interactive seminars, screenings, and extensive networking opportunities that will push the boundaries of sound. Whether you're an experienced professional or a newcomer to the world of audio, Sonic Days will be free for all attendees, ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to participate, learn, and connect, regardless of their background. This year's presenters at Sonic Days include past Tonebenders guests like Craig Hennigan, Peter Albrechtson, Shelley Roden, Katrina Amsler, Richard Lappington, and many more. Plus, new talks are still being added, with Michael Romanowski doing a talk about immersive music and Lydia Andrew, the creative director at DICE, just being announced. 
There will be talks that focus on game audio, film sound, museum installation sound design, automotive sound design, scripted audio drama, and lots of other topics. Get the full details on how to register for this free event at sonicdays.com. You both worked on Red Rocket. As I mentioned kind of in the intro, it's a very different film, but it still kind of feels like it's of the same voice. You feel like there's a through line with the director. But this film is bigger. It has a much bigger scope, it feels like. How do you think the sound goes about evolving, but still keeping that through line of keeping the director's voice? Yeah, this is a good question. I think with this one versus Red Rocket, as you said, it's a it's a bigger film in terms of its scale and scope. The through line being you know, that sense of realism and realness that, that Sean craves and his desire to shine a light on these characters and what they're going through, right? And characters that are often otherwise overlooked, providing a platform for those stories to be told and to resonate. On Honora, our marching orders are generally speaking realism, but then we have the opportunity to to expand upon that and, and get out of that sandbox and go for the hyper-real or for the stylized, you know, there's a couple of moments where we, we get very stylized. And I think it's just representative of what's on screen, you know, so much of the time it's what's what's on screen is informing, you know, what your mind and your heart wants to hear and feel, right? And so for us, I think it's just simply having the pleasure and joy of, of having a Sean Baker, you know, hand off his material to us and trust us with it. We just have to see what's on screen and, and feel it and vibe it and run with it. As fun and as challenging and as, as great as Red Rocket was, for all of the reasons that you highlighted about the size and scale and scope and Honora also being much longer, it just gives us a much wider palette to play with and enjoy. I, I don't know. I say this after all of his films, even after Florida Project and and from being an early fan, like seeing Tangerine and, and really like sort of resonating with that story, just... Um, you know, I'm just such a huge fan of the work, and so it's just really a pleasure just to just to get to play with him and his vision. John? During the spotting session, it's not like a hyper-real... He doesn't want a hyper-realistic film, but it has to be heightened, right? And there are scenes that are hyper-realistic, or and there's scenes, in, especially in this one, where we bend it a little with some of the comedic element of, of the sounds, because visually there's some things that are a little outside of realistic with the comedy. So that was kind of different than Red Rocket. Red Rocket, we could kind of map it out to be like, this is kind of uh, fully this one thing. With Enora, people are connecting with the comedy and a little more ebb and flow sometimes with it, but the overall arch of the direction is to not be hyper-realistic. But again, you know, we elevated backgrounds, elevated kind of tones through the movie and the other tricky thing in Anora was we're in this mansion right uh, so typically a mansion has really thick windows and so like is it going to be completely silent how do I do a Sean Baker movie where it's completely silent right <laughs> I kind of made the decision before Sean came in that this was going to be um, a mansion that actually didn't have, you know, that thick of windows and we could hear the traffic. And also there was a pivotal scene in the movie where she's yelling and they're saying, be quiet because they're worried that people outside are going to hear them. That wouldn't make sense if it was completely silent the whole movie through in that mansion. So we had to make it, we had to have peppered stuff coming from outside. It heightens the fun of the whole movie to have that stuff, you know. So our sound effects editors, Chris Smith and Adam Copold, Adam does uh, wonderful backgrounds and it gives me uh, lots of nice elements for um, different things to pepper in, you know, airplanes and all the nice traffic and all of that stuff. So that's a lot of fun in this movie, but it definitely made it more challenging than we can just, like in Red Rocket, you have a really crappy house that you could have anything leaking in that you wanted. We had to be more calculated in uh, in Enora. You know, I think it was a very fine line of like, okay, we can't get more than this because that just doesn't seem real, but we want to have this leakage. And then we had to map out the arc of the film, the heightened tension of all that stuff. So mapping that out. It was more tricky in this film, but it was a lot of fun. 
I think the mansion gave us a bit of an opportunity to have our cake and eat it too also though because you know like when we first arrive from Annie's perspective it's this she's overwhelmed she's in you know she's still in very much the fairy tale part of the you know part of the experience and so it's this environment that to her is screaming opulence and and a place of safety and comfort and and something to aspire to compared to her very gritty existence back at her apartment with her sister and so on. I think what was really super informative for me was that there's this beautiful reverb tale naturally in that that grand foyer down downstairs. So I just picked up on that immediately from production tracks and then very much leaned into that. So if I didn't have a boom that had that tail in it, I was then manufacturing that such that that entire space would have a similar sort of tail on the center and then broadening that out with a similar kind of 5-1 uh, verb to match. So on first blush, you know, we get the big heavy door, we get inside, oh, we're bowled over by the by the opulence of this place and we get to play that up with those those big reverbs and so on. And then... You know, the mansion becomes this sort of crucible for a shifting environment and tone, right? It's like the home invasion then takes us into this duality between like, oh, wait a minute, this movie maybe isn't a fairy tale, right? It's like, it is until it isn't, right? And so there's that pivotal scene there where we go into some pretty real danger, right? And so she's feeling very much under threat. But then it gets hilarious, right? It's like that whole thing where they they try to grab her and she ends up on the couch and kicks over the lampshade and the table and ends up smashing the the glass table and the whole thing, right? It's very slapstick, if you will, right? And then we get back to the threat and then we get another comedic moment. And so like, it's it's such a great space for for us to play and, and it's very pivotal in that tonal shift from this being this fairy tale, almost rom-com into then what, essentially turns into more like a sort of gangster, thug, like thriller kind of mystery, right? Hats off, obviously, to Sean for being able to craft that sequence and choreograph that such that the audience can go from that one experience of thinking they're watching this fantasy rom-com and then then take that left turn into into thriller. I mean, he's obviously got a a deft hand with that. And so... um, yeah, it was just a super fun sandbox for us to play in, in terms of, you know, amping up the comedy and then getting back to the threat and then back to the comedy and then back to the threat. His previous films uh, featured a lot of non-actors. This film has more professional actors. I believe a lot of the Russian side of the things, they're really accomplished actors over there that are new to us. But do you want to talk about maybe the difference between what it was like actually working with the sound of the non-actors versus the actors? It's interesting. I think, um, so like using Red Rocket as a comparison, because on, on Florida Project, I came in to mix that one. And so I hadn't been involved in the, the editorial process. So certainly in Red Rocket, you know, the, you don't get what you would typically get, you know, when you get a turnover, right? You don't have coverage, you don't have multiple takes. You, you know, so it's just sort of like you get what you get and, and you make it work. With this, with the Nora, there's, there's still an element of that element of surprise in terms of like what's being turned over in the production tracks. But things are a bit more set up as we're more accustomed to with more coverage and, and so on. I think actually some of the Russian actors, I don't think they necessarily spoke English prior to Anora. You know, it's sort of like they're learning the language as, and their lines. And so they're doing this. They've, they're translating in their own brain, assumedly, you know, like, oh, OK, how, what am I thinking and feeling and how do I say this in my native tongue? Oh, and now I have to translate that, that into Russian and, and then compound that with the fact that, again, Sean every day is like changing everything up and a couple of scenes are heavily choreographed. A lot of it is very loosey-goosey. One of the tricky things on this one, they hired production mixer recordist for the fact that they spoke Russian. They had a lot less experience maybe than uh, what we were used to. That was important to Sean that he could communicate with the talent. Then the other thing I wanted to mention was when we get the edits, Sean loves all the junk in there, right? So with Red Rocket, I remember strict rules with everyone. Don't cut out the junk. Well, what does that mean? You know, like, yes, we're cutting out clicks and pops. We're getting rid of hum. But if there's a weird sound off on the side, that should stay in there. We had a scene when they're outside the courthouse where there's a siren, this really long siren. We have to keep that and we have to make it work 
so sometimes that's tricky, especially with the elongated sounds like sirens, you know, red rocket, there was crosswalk signs, all these things, because now the edit not only has to work for the dialogue, but all of those extraneous sounds have to be fluid as well. So the, the siren has to be fluid. It has to be a consistent level when it comes in in the edit. It's a lot of fun. It's 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 like it definitely is a different experience. And um, you know, we've had on Red Rocket, we had a, another amazing team of dialogue editors. Um, we're telling these people, hey, don't clean it up. Keep that stuff in there, which I love because you know I really connect with that. I love. There's a Spanish term about the squeak between the guitar uh, notes, the squeaky. And I love that because it's like, you know, the idea is that's where life exists. That's where how we connect with things um, emotionally. That was true when I, you know, the music that we did with film and TV and the, the way I like to sound design anyway before even working with Sean was I love having that that emotional element. It's like um, mixing a Britney Spears album as opposed to like a Radiohead, you know, like the Britney Spears, you're going to want to clean it up as much as possible. But in a Radiohead album, if you're taking out all these weird stuff when you're mixing it, you're, you're going to destroy the glue. It can be tricky, like sometimes where you're like a lot of people talking at one time. Do I take this person out? Are we supposed to hear this other person? Because it's not like a typical shoot where it's like, okay, everyone else be quiet. We're shooting this character. No, it's kind of like everything's going on at the same time. And it came really tricky when we went to do the m and &E. And I had to explain to them, like, look, all that stuff off screen, I can't just cut. The it's all happening at once especially like, you know, the scene in Tatiana's, the um, the nightclub. I mean, all this stuff is going on. It's all happening. And so the edit has to to work. Obviously, like, we have to hear what the primary characters are saying. But all of that other stuff, you know, there's a lot going on. So it's fun and super cool. I love the realist, but it definitely has its challenges that are unique to, to a, a Sean Baker film. Yeah, we have to embrace the chaos. You walk in to sit down at the chair at 9 a.m. and put your mixing hat on and forget most of what you've known and learned over the last 20 years and, and you know, go with a wholehearted new approach, which means that mixing that the requires a lot more hard work on a typical feature where you've got coverage, you've got, you've got angles, you've got, you know, great Foley recordings, you've got everything on the production side cleaned up, PFX split out and so on. You know, it's a different set of tasks versus you've got really pretty rough production audio where everything's married and you're trying to draw focus to this particular character that's speaking amidst the chaos for this these few three words, and then you want to shift the focus over to that guy. And, and it's all coming at you like largely on a boom and occasionally with some lobs that are usable. Not always, but most of the time, yeah. So it's a lot of like very intricate, you know, clip gain work and really getting in there and, and you know, working those faders hard to, to get in and out of stuff. So, you, you know, you're working up a bit more of a sweat, like mixing dialogue on a Sean Baker film than, than maybe on a, on a traditional film that's part of the challenge and part of the fun and at the end of the day i mean it's really nice to hear people think and believe that they watched something that that resonated with them on an emotional level because it just worked on so many levels and obviously sound is part of the the entire process and so for us you know we look at it from the other side of the glass where we're like oh my gosh we were like all over the place and like cutting this hard and moving this around and doing all this like bizarre trickery that makes us sort of maybe cringe a little bit and, and it makes it a little hard to sleep at night sometimes. For people that aren't privy to what we get to see, you know, we get to see the guts of the engine. It's just really rewarding to hear that people are resonating with the film and, and enjoying it. I said, uh, before we started the mix, I said, Andy, we're, I'm going to install seatbelts because this is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's awesome. As I said, it was my favorite film that I saw at TIFF this year. I think it's going to be amongst my favorite films I see this year, uh, if not number one. So thank you very much for talking to me about it, and uh, congratulations. And I, I really hope this film finds an audience, because uh, it deserves it, and I think people will really enjoy it if they uh, go out to the theater and give it a chance. Yeah, thank you, Tim. We, we feel the same way. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for taking the time. 
Big thanks to John and Andy for chatting with me. Listeners, go and search out Enora. You want to see it in a cinema so you can really hear how they put the detail into one of the speakers in the strip club that has a torn cone in it. It's really an amazing thing to hear once you know that it's there. It's a really good film and it's well worth your attention. Don't forget about Sonic Days in Denmark next month, November 19th through 21st. Head to sonicdays.com for all the details. It's free, so please don't miss it if you can make it there. My name is Tim Muirhead. This episode of Tonebenders has been presented by Sound Ideas and their latest library, Just Wind Sound Effects. From sinister breaths of wind to the dramatic power of a tornado, with 567 melodic howls, groans, and whistles, check it out at sound-ideas.com. Okay, talk to you next week. We have a great one for you, so stay tuned. Tonebenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 